tournaments and stuff. Oh right? yeah, big deal. Hi everybody! Oh, she snuck it in. Oh, she did a <laughs> sneaky <laughs> thing. Did a sneaky oh, 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 yeah. Well, once you moved away from fascism and moved to bridge, I thought we're oh, no. safe. Oh, wait, 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 Bo. We can go statement. back. Wait a minute. Bo has a statement that he's prepared to make for the entire. Wait a minute. Episode. Okay, Bo. Say we're we're still one or two minutes before we're official start. I'm not going to say it because I don't want to professionally destroy myself accidentally. I That's mean, wise. That's very wise, Bo. You want to do Ladies it and gentlemen, hi you know, hey, everybody. Hour, we're lives here at us. Well, we are, we are live. We're about ready to go really live. Why are we uh, live early? Why are we live I, early? Because you were discussing April's, Bridge and it was hilarious. April, April's bored. That's why. Wait, we no, were. No, it was Bridge. It's, it's good. Was it's good, good SPSM. Tony sure. was mansplaining Bridge to us, and in some way, making us, even though he's not very good at Bridge, making us feel inferior over his yeah. Bridge skills. No, oh, yeah. it wasn't. It's terrible. Oh, don't it's even, terrible. don't even try to. Don't even. Don't do not negate me. You you cannot annihilate me, Tony. I thought I opened with being a bad. <laughs> don't gaslight me over your Bridge. You I'm not a good Bridge player. I'm a bad Bridge player. You were, but you're a bridge player. Do you yeah, eat bridge mix? It's kind of like it's kind of like I, I I don't own the best thoroughbred horses, but I own thoroughbred horses. It was that kind of an <laughs> argument, right? It was it was like that. Well, you know, funny you'd mention that. I did learn to ride on Arabians. <laughs> that's true. That was awesome. It's not, it's not a joke. Absolutely. That's true. <laughs> Is that really true? <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely true. Oh, well, they're beautiful like animals. Play, they're, they're not the brightest things. But they are the beautiful. Faces scare me. Yeah, the faces are too We're really live. live for minutes. That's we're really uh, live. I know, but it's nine up at this hour. Uh, because the, the facts are that you've stumbled in to hashtag SPSM. That stands for the Suicide Prevention Social Media Chat. And I'm at Doc Foreman, uh, your intrepid host. I'm not a bridge player, but we're so excited about tonight's topic, which, like bridge, is something that is hard for me to understand or explain. So, of course, we're going to do an hour about this because net neutrality uh, or losing net neutrality will impact everyone and it will impact the field of suicide prevention. Uh, I'm so excited uh, because tonight I may not be competent to moderate this chat. So we brought we brought back one of your favorite recent SPSM alums to help with this. This was a requested uh, part two follow up and we think also very important because there's a vote coming up this week. But before we launch into that, we want to do a special shout out to folks who have lost somebody to suicide. Uh, as many of you know, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, right, was Suicide Loss Survivors Day. Um, for those of you who are new to suicide prevention, what what is really important to understand is that for everybody who dies by suicide, they leave dozens, perhaps hundreds, some folks who are impacted by that loss. Uh, Dr. Julie Serrell, uh, board uh, president of the American Association of Suicidology, will tell you it's not just six people, you know, who are survivors left to cope with the loss, but that many people are impacted by suicide loss. I am a clinician suicide loss survivor. We have uh, loss survivors here with us hosting and some of you who are in the Twitter chat. If you would like to take a minute uh, to comment about uh, Lost Survivor Day, go ahead and tag your tweets survivor and just talk about that. I know that there were lost survivor activities across the country. Anne Marie Machulis, I always sort of struggle with names and, and the last name, Amory, I'm so sorry if I, if I screwed up, but she was tweeting about that. Uh, Janet Schnell, who is the Lost Survivor Division Chair at the American Association of Suicidology was talking about that. Uh, folks on the panel, any Lost Survivor activities this week that you guys know about? I know, Chris, you were talking about some. You wanna just ch chime in real quick? Yeah, if I can find the mute button. Uh, no, it's uh, <laughs> AFSB always has um, a lot of information on their website about uh, lo local and regional events. Um, they already have their uh, 2018 uh, page up and running, uh, where you can find out about what it is, what the uh, what the films are that they're planning on using for for next year's event. I've been setting up an event and creating um, some buzz around this. Um, and then you can actually put in information that uh, will show where these are across the country. So you can pop in your zip code and uh, get some Diet Mountain Dew from Bart. 
Ah, uh, fantastic. And if I buy the expensive Hootsuite account, maybe maybe, maybe we uh, can be more mindful about sharing resources for lost survivors in the week leading up to Lost Survivor Day. Um, please do, uh, we'll tweet out that resource uh, so that people can have that handy for next year. So that if there is a Lost Survivor event, virtual or in person, that is uh, meaningful to you, I really hope that you'll do it. Um, it feels, uh, it's very comforting, very supportive, and very healing uh, to be with people who understand this, this thing that has happened to you, this loss that you've survived, and can help you figure out what to do with very complicated feelings that you might have. And we just want to do a shout out to folks about that. I'd like to introduce now the rest of the people. Mr. Tony Wood, say hi to the people. Hey, everybody. I'm Tony Wood at ADWW on Twitter. I'm also the COO of Quantify, a, oh, I forget what Bart says, uh, nifty uh, little, I know that I'm trying to not, I'm trying to not do that to Bart. Bart uh, I know, Bart, well, that's not true. He can't, he can and does, and I should listen. Um, <laughs> but, oh well, all things aside, uh, Quantify is a wonderful company that is dedicated to the, it's a computer software company dedicated to the intersection of mental health and computer science. Donate your data today at ourdatahelps.org. Also, the chair of the board of the American Association of Suicidology, suicidology.org. Join today. And we have a lost survivor division, and we have a special day of conference, our annual conference do. dedicated. This. So, uh, like, of the hope feel free to reach out to Janet Schnell, who is our Lost Survivor Chair, and do feel free to access suicidology.org for resources and events. Janet's a charmer. Uh, Dr. Bart Andrews, say hi to the people. Hey, people. Dr. Bart Andrews. I'm Vice President of Telehealth and Home and Community Services at a groovy little crisis line in St. Louis, Missouri called Behavioral Health Response. I'm excited about the show. I, uh, full disclosure, net neutrality confuses me. Um, I know enough to be utterly confusing about it. Um, and, uh, but I think this is a really important topic that we're discussing, right? Um, I will comment on the Lost Survivors. Last week I was presenting at a church. I did four church services. Um, in the space of 17 hours at the first method and, and that explains the mysterious fires in St. Louis. Um, oh, wow. yeah, it, wow. it was in Jefferson City. Wow. So, um, so it was in Jefferson City, Missouri. But one of the things that was, that was really um, uh, powerful is that after each presentation, um, you, I would go out with the Reverend and shake hands with everybody leaving the service. And the number of people who disclosed that they were lost survivors was phenomenal. Um, and many of them uh, told me it was the first time they had told another person that they were a lost survivor. And so it's really wow. interesting being a, being a lost survivor talking about it's, it's like, I'm a lost survivor. Um, my uncle died of suicide when I was 19. Um, I talk about it frequently. One of the reasons I do is because when we talk about this, uh, people out there who are living with this, who don't talk about it, have more support in talking about it. <clears throat> and it turns out that we're not alone. There's a lot of us out there. I have a, I have a theory um, in terms of life incidents that there's probably more of us that know somebody than don't know somebody, actually. <clears throat> but you wouldn't know that because it's really hard to talk about. Um, and, we, and we're making it easier to talk about. And that's why uh, things like Lost Survivor Day are incredibly important. Um, and talking about our, our experience with loss is really important. So and I, and I think we'll find a way to tie that in to bridge Lost Survivors and Net Neutrality in the show. We're that good. Twist. Now, we're going to, in, in an SPSM twist, I'm going to be handing over moderation to Chris Maxwell, who will introduce himself and the guest and get the conversation off and rolling. Because by the end of this, they're going to make sure I can discuss net neutrality. I tried on the way in on the, on the warm-up to the show. It didn't go well. So Chris Maxwell, moderator extraordinaire. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Maxwell. Uh, I work for the largest national suicide prevention hotline in the country. I also serve as co-chair for the Strategic uh, Media Response Task Force for the American Association of Suicidology. Um, I uh, am thrilled to talk about net neutrality. It is one of the most important things that is happening right now. It is going to affect so many things, including crisis intervention, suicide prevention work that we're doing now. So uh, let's figure out what that means. Let's do an explain it like I'm five, Bo. Um, and Bo Pinkham. Hi, 
Dude, is that you in introducing me? That was awful. Bob Pinkham from this uh, place no, up that's in fine. Uh, <laughs> No, shut up. Anyway, hi. I'm Bo Pinkham. I'm from the Crisis Center of Johnson County. I'm director of Crisis Intervention Services. Thank you so much, Chris. I'm happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you, Bo. Uh, so what do you yeah. want me to do? A five-minute explanation of net neutrality? No, 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 no. Explain it. Explain it. Explain like, net neutrality. Like explain it like I'm five years old. Okay. To me. So we've all basically given this caveat, but I am in no way an expert on net neutrality, right? I just brought up the topic, and now we're talking about it. But basically, <laughs> net neutrality, uh, or what's coming up with net neutrality, is the government is going to hold a vote on whether or not to give a whole bunch of power back to the uh, companies that provide internet in the U.S., um, and those powers include whether or not they could limit their bandwidth uh, for certain websites, certain streaming services, certain social media apps, whatever you want. Um, and uh, also along with that is like better powers of like monitoring their own data, um, what they can do with that data, what they can release to other people and other companies and stuff like that. So it's really taking a lot taking away a lot of federal oversight into what our internet companies do and just kind of opening up the market as they would say and letting them do whatever they want, basically. So, so one of the regulation. Yeah. I mean, yes, I don't think it's technically a deregulation, but it's basically like a deregulation. That worked you know I mean? well for the banking industry. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really did. I mean, my again, I'm doing well, so. You know. Um, Chris, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Chris. I'm still pretty confused. <laughs> okay, so two things, two things that I think, are, and we can get into the weeds in a second, but I think there are two really big things to talk about here up front. First of all, um, the FCC and its uh, what do they have? A chairman? Now, what is um, the FCC? The federal. Uh, uh, the. Federal Communications Communications Commission. Yeah, yeah. So the FCC is the the governmental body that regulates uh, all communications. So uh, cable companies and cell phone providers, internet service providers, these things are under um, under the uh, the overwatch of the FCC. Uh, so like when when uh, we had the fun Janet Jackson uh, mishap at the Super Bowl, the, nipples the FCC. The nipple slip. F the FCC were the ones who then fined uh, the producers for the for the Super Bowl for for letting. So, do they make money on all the nipples on the internet? No, they don't. Uh, no. <laughs> who does? This show is off to a great start, everybody. <laughs> We've already said so. Nipples. So, the big thing here, the big thing here, uh, is the the chairman for the FCC is. Um, has been railing against uh, net, the concept of net neutrality since he was appointed. Um, and the, the issue is a lot of these people that have, in the last few years, been working in high-level positions in the FCC actually come from bigger, like, uh, bigger service providers like Verizon or Comcast or things like that. So they may still have their toes in some of these bigger things. I'm not trying to go down a conspiracy theory. Um, but you have to have, it's important to have some of this context to know where people's motivations lie, I think. So you have the current FCC chairman who is uh, Ajit Pai, um, who has been reeling against this since he came in, into his position. Um, now they've, they've uh, talked about it several times, and they've hidden it in certain ways that make it a little bit suspicious in how they're handling it. They opened up uh, some... Uh, a, a uh, avenue, an avenue for people, the general public, to provide feedback if net neutrality were to be repealed. Uh, those got attacked. There were some big issues with that, and and they stopped paying attention to it. They basically tried to push it under the rug. Now the the deal is this: this vote is happening, and it's happening soon. It is happening sometime next month. Our announcing that this vote is happening on Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, when they know that no one will be paying attention. Um, so now is the time that we, we can start looking at this and start acting. Um, if you want to uh, reach out to your representatives, 
Um, there's a website called battleforthenet.com, which makes it super easy. You, you put in your phone number, and they uh, basically make it really easy to contact your, your representatives. So and I just wanted to get that out. Very, first. very quickly, SPSM is like not a 504c3 or a group or anything. We're just a bunch of people talking about stuff in our own personal life. So we're just going to, people are just going to advocate for their own personal opinions, not those of uh, any employers. Just heads up, folks. Anyway, uh, go ahead, Chris. I'm just happy that I, I had to make you throw out a disclaimer. I feel I'm proud of that. <laughs> I was like, remember. We just say what we want because this is a bunch of people doing a show. Anyway, so, go ahead. So to put it super simply for everybody, we are all pro net neutrality, right, Chris? If you're using the internet right now, you probably should be. I'm and not going to. And we're against deregulation. Correct. Okay, go ahead. Um. Um, one of the ways, and I'll let, I'll, I'll let Bo talk about this, but like uh, one of the ways that I like to, to view uh, what would happen if net neutrality were to be repealed is if you think about, um, let's say if you think about how you uh, access cable currently. When you uh, sign up for a new cable plan, you are usually presented with like a base level where you, you have like 30 channels or whatever. And then you have to pay uh, more for each tier that includes different channels. Uh, premium channels like HBO cost certain more, and those usually in their own packages. Um, internet service providers and cell phone carriers will have the right, if net neutrality is repealed, to charge you for the use of certain apps. Like they will charge you at different tiers based on your bandwidth usage so that you can use things like Facebook Messenger um, and not Facebook itself. Um, so they can kind of piecemeal this and make you pay for more and more so that you have and you pay the most, right, to get the access to the entire internet. Um, so that's just one example of, of what might be possible in, in so, some of the nefarious stuff happening. So, but wait, let's talk about because it's important, because the rules that's going to be appealed. Bart, let's hear from Bart. Does this so the, mean this that people with what's no, no, your name is not Bart. No, it's not. Yes, it April. is. No, it no, isn't. You're no, we've covered this before. Bart. You're April. You're April, so, April. So here's, here's the question for Chris and Bo. The rules that they're talking about repeal, repealing are rules that were put in place in 2015. Yeah. So we weren't paying more for different things in 2014. Um, it was everything works the same as it does that I can tell to end user as it did um, now in 2017 as it did in uh, up to December 31st, 20, 2014. So what the hell did they do in 2015, and is that really going to kill net neutrality? Because I think this is the thing that people don't understand, um, and what's different between now and, and two and a half years ago? Bo? Well, um, I mean, the rules that were put in place in 2015 basically just cemented other stuff that happened in kind of like the late 90s. Um, and so it was really more of a formalization of things that had already been agreed upon, and so, but now they were law after 2015 um and i mean tony do you disagree or you, uh, we didn't hear from april. april okay that's something important, that's important to, say. to say i was trying to clarify so with the net neutrality does this mean that people who have less money won't be able to afford to have the same amount of access to content and or to to or I don't know if it's content or access. Like it's like playing paying a toll. Like the, there's going to be certain roads that are just on the on the on the information highway that it's just going to cost more. That means that people with fewer means won't be able to get to certain things or won't be able to get to them easily. And does this also mean um, that those folks that that we could they could they have the power to restrict traffic to things topics that they don't like? Say so FCC. Amber Cannon is saying the FCC. You know, they 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 do things like the seven words you can't say on the radio and stuff like that. Like, could they could that mean that then corporations could decide that suicide's an unsavory topic and ratchet down certain kinds of suicide conversations? Well, that's a little far field, and nobody really knows. So the the reality is, if you allow large corporations to decide what websites that you can visit really fast for free. Like currently, but currently when you pay for an unlimited internet connection, you get access to the entire internet at the same speed. So that means we can enjoy things like streaming services, like the one we're on right now, 
and it doesn't cost anybody any more. It's unclear what would happen in the future. There's a whole bunch of different business models that could be that could spring forth from this. So it's not that it's not that tiered internet is evil. It's that generally speaking it's not gr it's not been great for public health to allow large corporations to do whatever they would like. No, no, Citizens United seemed like it worked out really well though. Um, Ooh, ouch. So yeah, so that's that's a really interesting that's a really interesting question. We don't know, right? Tony's right, like we don't know any of this. Um, and so it's it's what net neutrality is, and I think uh here too, um that vote in 2015 was really just to solidify the the open nature of of the net, um, so that you couldn't do some of these things like forced throttling, um, which is uh, lowering um, access speeds on on bandwidth and stuff like that. So, um, just like you like Bo said, just regulating those things and making them law and making sure that you can't they they can't take advantage of those things. Um, and I, I don't know whether or not it was a, a situation where the corporations were not thinking about ways in, in which they could do that, but there were certainly some issues with throttling going on yeah. um, and, and data usage and yeah. Every, everything in 2015 was just the government decided to get out ahead of all the legis not legislation, lawsuits and court battles that were happening based off the previous rules in the FCC. So. And you have to remember, right, I mean, none of this is done in a vacuum. It's not like the entire U.S. government in 2015 decided, yes, we should do this. There were significant voices against net neutrality even in 2015. Um, you know, there were Republican commissioners on, that, on the FCC or whatnot who were pushing against it. It's just at that time, uh, the Democrats had more sway on the commission and were able to get what they wanted. Um, now is not so much the case. So. So my my question then is leading from April's question about uh, what access might look like for people, or, or even what people might be allowed to talk about. Does how does the potential for providing crisis intervention services online look without uh, like I mean and a lot of this is supposition, but how could it possibly go wrong? Yeah, I mean, and it's really it can it can affect two sides, right? It's going to affect like folks like me and other crisis centers and the suicide prevention community, uh, you know, providers and all, you know, everything wrapped up with that. And then it's going to affect the people that we actually are trying to serve, right? So I can try to talk about both sides, but uh, just talking about the consumers, for instance, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on with what what could happen. We don't know, obviously, what would what what it would look like if you know, neutrality was completely gutted. We're just assuming it's bad, uh, operating under that assumption. Uh, when people don't have access, uh, you know, when people don't have access to the streaming sites that they usually want, you know, like that's going to be, that's going to be tough on anyone. But especially for like, if you have a crisis center, say, or some kind of suicide prevention service that's on like a specific, you know, domain host, you have to check to make sure that your domain, domain host is then working nice with all the internet service providers uh, out there. Um, and before they didn't have to do that. So do you have to petition on their behalf to make sure that they're like interacting with every internet service provider well? Do you have to contact them? Do you contact the internet service providers instead? It's just, uh, that's a whole messy issue. Um, and there's a lot of other things. Like we mentioned apps, you know, uh, uh, Facebook Messenger is a good example. So like between Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp, those are utilized more than text mm -hmm. worldwide is. So if the cell phone companies who are covered under the FCC um, and would have a big stake in net neutrality, if they could suddenly say, you know what, we're going to charge you a whole bunch if you start using WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, but if you use our tech services, which are like, you know, cheaper for us to provide, but we can still upcharge you so much per text or whatever, that's what we're going to do so that they can maximize their profits. Meanwhile, it completely negates like certain people's uh, people's ways of con you know contacting each other contacting other providers so i don't know it's it's really so really can i can i ask another dumb question sure there are no dumb questions only well, dumb people only dumb exactly 
So, I mean, when, when, we, when we do things like crisis lines, there are toll-free numbers specifically because we want to be sensitive to the cost that people incur when they reach out for help. So, like, net neutrality is the opposite of that. It might be people reach, help, reach out for help. Like, you know, corporations have a, have a lot of say in what they're charged. And, and, I mean, will there be some sort of corresponding, like, how do you get a toll-free number so that with different levels of economic resources, you can help everybody fairly. I mean, how are they going to handle things like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's what's frustrating for us, right? Is as su if net neutrality is gutted, you know, we won't. There will be probably a year or two, right, of companies interacting with each other and figuring. Like the markets will have to level out in a different level, right? So all these internet service providers are suddenly going to have to start talking to all these domain providers, the the social media pro, like apps, uh, video game companies, you know, like anybody who provides internet in any, you know, or works in the internet in any way. It's really going to level out in ways that we don't understand, right? So, I mean, maybe this could, you know, I'll just be devil's advocate. This could be good for the consumer in certain ways, you know, like taking suicide prevention as a specific example, no internet service provider wants to get bad media and like suddenly people who are trying to access say national suicide prevention lifelines life, like crisis chat suddenly can't do a, you know, high speed connection to that website because the domain host didn't play fair with Comcast. Comcast doesn't want that. Right. So they'll probably give certain domain domains, domain providers or whatnot, a free pass just based off that alone. But we don't know. We, have, we just absolutely have no clue. So I usually operate under the assumption that things will go wrong because that's usually what happens. Um, when you let so, yeah. corporations do anything. This gets a little bit in, you know, into the weeds. However, what is driving all of this is the Netflix effect. The Netflix, the effect of Netflix and YouTube and Hulu streaming services because mm -hmm. they account for such a large portion of internet traffic on consumer on consumer and even corporate networks. Yep. And the and the our corporate overlords, our friend our partners in success that is. Uh, look at the traffic going across their networks and they see this much video streaming and they see this much regular traffic. You know things like we're concerned about uh, reaching reaching resources, suicide prevention as a concept, all sorts of other traffic is like this, and YouTube and Netflix are like this, and the good people at Netflix and YouTube, which is Google, are making a killing. They're just making a fortune on uh, on popular media, and the distribution networks like Comcast and Cox and now the new ones, Verizon, AT&T, Cellular, are all people who are used to getting a piece of that revenue. And they believe, in somewhat rightly so, that they deserve a piece of the revenue in order, because they're delivering the content to you. They're acting as the distribution network. Whereas it used to be television, over the air broadcast TV, now it's internet streaming, it's internet streaming, and they believe that they deserve some money back to them for dealing with the problems that are caused by everybody getting really excited about the new episodes on Stranger Things, for example. And they all want, and everybody wants to watch it all at the same time. And the good people at Comcast have to be prepared for those spikes. Well, that creates a lot of infrastructure issues for them. And so their argument is that they should be able to charge Netflix more to deliver that content to you, the consumer, because they deserve to be paid for that service. The argument, however, is that the counter argument is that the consumer is paying for an unlimited internet connection and they should cost that into the price for the consumer. So where the money will ultimately go, nobody actually knows. We just know that it looks like the prices are going to go up no matter what. So is this like when you have um, like, a, like a truck that's delivering goods to like a Walmart or whatever, and they, they, hit, a, they hit a toll road and they get charged a higher toll, and, and so the company shipping the goods has to pay more for, because there's the road and there's the truck delivering it. 
and then they pass that on in the prices. Yes, the consumer yeah. always pays. This is yeah. not a question of whether the consumer will pay or not. This is a question of how the consumer will pay. Yeah. How will that the, cost? This, it's, it's, very, it's very unlikely that this will mean cheaper anything for anyone, probably. But, and you know, so that's where, I mean, but it might be for certain levels, probably not the end consumer, as Tony said. The end consumer is probably screwed with a net neutrality. I mean, maybe. Mm, Would you I, not agree? I, I don't necessarily. The reason I don't agree is that we as consumers are have, have a solid habit of being more and more demanding on our internet connections. Internet mm -hmm. connections used to, you know, sound like this. And it was just text and some very simple images. And then gradually we got to CD streaming, you know, love cruddy quality audio streaming, real audio, if anybody remembers that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then gradually we got to full motion video, which was so exciting, the dancing baby thing. Is that, is that, 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 one? that one. And then and then South Park, the South Park clip episode for Christmas. And then gradually it got more and more until we're looking at 4K full-on cinema quality distributed content awesome sauce mm. well that that's a lot fancier than just text and images and it requires a lot more infrastructure now has the price gone up sure it's gone up you know it used to be you know internet average internet connection used to be 19 dollars, maybe maybe 16.95 sometimes early internet was more expensive but the price quickly dropped well, now, if you're, you know, it depends, it depends on your situation, but a lot of people are shelling out the better part of $100 for an internet connection today uh, because we get all these wonderful services. We shop online. We watch all of our media online. We catch up with our blogs. We download our audio books. If you're me, we everything, it does everything for us. Well, that demand that is created by consumer you know, desire is continually going up. So that price is probably going to continue to go up as a per, as a percentage of your media spent. But remember, a lot of people are cutting their cable. So they're not subscribing to cable anymore. So they're cutting out 50, 75 in my case. And, and, and I, and uh, I hold on to your hats. I was paying the better part of $300 a month at one oh point in my life. Uh, because I just bought everything. I wanted it all. Yeah. Well, I cut that out entirely. Um, I think it's been five years. And my internet connection price did not go up. I paid the same amount for internet, about $89. I think I might pay $100 today. You know, it's not that, $10, right? Um, well, that's lost revenue for the, for the cable companies and for the networks themselves of quite a pretty penny when you're talking about $300 a month revenue loss and people are cutting cable like nobody's business. So that means that the price, and many people do not have a choice of providers. For example, here in Waltham, Massachusetts, sure. right outside of Boston, you would think, oh, I'm in a giant metro area, I should be able to choose from 50 different ISPs. No, this particular building has services from basically one provider, unless you wanna use cellular, which is very expensive. Uh, you get to do business with Comcast and you get to love it. So, <laughs> or you get nothing. So that's why I argue that like this price situation, the price is likely to go up because of these other things that are happening. This ruling is very important because of how that, that cost will be distributed and how transparent it will be and how many people will have to share in that cost. Because right now it's pretty evenly shared in the future, I can imagine a situation where basically pretty poor people, you know, people whose incomes are very constrained are going to pay a lot more for less than they do today. So, I, so I need to ask another dumb question, especially for people who are in the crisis line business, which is Bo and Chris and Bart. Do, are there, do we have people in the crisis line industry and the suicide, like, prevention industry because it's about access to emergency and crisis services and for people like do we have people who really understand this and are getting us all prepared for this maybe no and, and no we I don't, I don't think we i don't first of all april i think there's probably uh in the country there's probably less than 100 people maybe 200 people that truly understand the the intricacies of what the hell we're actually talking about 
to be quite honest. And when you, when you do a bunch of reading on this, it becomes really clear that this is incredibly complicated. So I think that there, there's some things that, that we haven't touched on that we need to touch on. One, the, the, the common carrier rule. So net, net neutrality is really this a way to say that internet providers fall under the common carrier rule, which goes way back to the 30s, um, making sure that the, the, the phone system was protected and that everybody had equal access to the phone system and all this kind of stuff. Well, it turns out in 2005, um, it, the, it was ruled that, that uh, internet service providers are not bound by the common carrier uh, legislation. They're, they're exempt from it. They don't fit. What they did, what the FCC did was, but we still have to have some guidelines, right? So there's some guidelines. That we, there needs to be some, at least some rules and some general ways to make sure that folks are, are playing fair about this, right? Um, and so that's when we came with the rules. And here's some really interesting things about this that are really quite compelling. What people often don't realize is that, in fact, the internet, um, although uh, important for universities and important for the military, um, uh, porn uh, made the fucking internet. Right, people do not realize yeah. that in, that in fact that in fact it was a private industry, um, uh, the, the sex industry that actually fueled the huge explosion of internet access. So the fact that you can the fact that you can get on your computer and down and stream Netflix, thank the porn industry because without the porn industry in 2017, you would not be having these super high speed um, rates and you wouldn't have the access to the internet you have. So one of the things the government built in, there's actually a clause in 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 the, the legislation that says. Hey, you you can't censor content. You can't. It's up to it's up to parents um, and the individual consumer to censor content. Um, the government is not in the business of censoring content on the on the interwebs. Um, that that's really good. Let's be really clear about that. That they don't have that in China, right? Um, they don't have that in Russia. So nope. that, so, so when we when we talk about net neutrality, um, people uh, wrap up a bunch of different things into what net neutrality is, and and this. This new um, move by FCC, which has actually been in the works for a while, even before um, Obama was um, out of office and President Trump was in, um, was to, to roll back Obama's decision to say that, right, that Internet providers were, in fact, utilities. That's basically what the 2015 ruling was, that Internet providers were utilities. Now... There's lots of people that think that's a really bad decision, and at, at the policy wonk end, there's good folks on both sides that say this is problematic for a lot of different ways. But I think people are panicked about this. I don't think we're going to, even if this vote goes through, I don't think we're going to notice any goddamn difference, certainly not for years. I think Bo's point is salient um, that, in fact, there's going to be lots of behind the scenes, and apparently one of the things that they're going to do with this new ruling is um, instill uh, better transparency that, in fact, people will have access to what deals are being made so that we can actually know what the hell's going on. Whether you believe that or not is up to you. Um, uh, but but that's apparently one of the goals. Now, in terms of crisis line work, um, and it's work we do, it's probably not going to have any impact. Most people are connecting to us over phones. They're connecting to uh, they're connecting to us um, uh, via uh, text and chat. To some extent, maybe chat's the most vulnerable here. I would guess, right? That in fact, that that in fact, uh, uh, chat providers it, it could some way it slow down um, your. But I don't. I'm going to be honest. I don't think chat uses up a lot of data in the first place. No. So so I, I don't. I think I think where where I think this has the biggest potential impact in is is the idea that. And I was actually talking to 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 wow. Jess um, in Colorado about this. At some point. Um, some of the phone providers right now, like like at a crisis line, like at BHR, our, our, we have a provider that provides both our phone, they provide our, our SMS text short code, which is then actually there's layers to how that works. They provide our chat. The question is the channel for video communication. So the, what's going to happen at some point is instead of having a, a text app and a chat app and all these different things, you'll be able to just access um, somebody um, and then you'll be able to use whatever tools you want to have that conversation. You can switch back and forth to text. You could then switch into video. You could then, th this could all be queued and all be on lines where you could literally ex exchange mediums of communication back and forth. Probably the biggest impact that I would expect this to have would be on uh, telehealth um, and people using, because video is in fact the, the largest bandwidth user, right? Um, and, and telehealth right now is not so much a consumer to provider as it is facility um, to facility, um, uh, although that I think that could change. So that potentially could have an impact. 
but but I'm on a range here. But this is the thing: is that the more reading I, I do about net neutrality, it's pretty clear that nobody really knows what the hell they're talking about, no. <clears throat> and and that a lot of the arguments, both for and against it, um, people can refute and say, well, the data doesn't support this, the data doesn't support that. I'll give you an example that was really fascinating. Do you guys know about Facebook's plan in India? Did you guys know about what Facebook planned to do in oh, India? Oh, absolutely, yes. So so this is no. what. Th Oh, good. So let's talk about that. So this is this is what people are concerned about, and the, and the the folks in India shut it down. But Facebook was basically going to give people free internet access, right? They were gonna they were, and this is and I've got mixed feelings about this. They were going to make sure that the poorest of the poor, everybody in the flipping country, had internet access, yep. and it was going to be limited internet access, and it was going to include, of course, one of the things that you would have access to is Facebook. You wouldn't have access to Twitter. Right, you wouldn't necessarily have access. Who do, who doesn't Facebook own? They they own do they own Instagram or is that Google? They own they Instagram. Own. They own Instagram. So you get Instagram, you get Facebook. You probably wouldn't get spot, uh, uh, Snapchat. I guess Snapchat isn't a Facebook product. You so, get Wikipedia. You'd get some. You, their their the concept was to provide a lot of things, but yes. they were but definitely were looking to boost their own ad ad revenue. Minutes. Yeah. In, it, the the opening of the Asian markets is a huge thing, and uh, un, but unfortunately, a large portion of the of those markets are made up of the world's poorest people. Poorest. So here, so the question is, so this is where things get really things get really complicated. Is it better? Here, a company is willing to give literally hundreds of millions of people who don't have internet access internet access for free was, for free, but it was shut down because they didn't want to have the they didn't want that corporation to have that much influence and power in their country. So right. what, what the net neutrality really is about is do you want the government in control um, of, of, of these things and do you want the government the one making decisions or do you want the, the market and private corporations to, 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 to control these things the, the argument being that if the government's in control and they're making this the, these the artificially clamping down on the market there's less incentive for investment and innovation um, and that there's a greater cost of doing startup type work this is all true the impact of it nobody really knows um, the 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 flip side is that um, if you if you get rid of it, companies can really pour investment in, they can get more bang for the buck. They can actually get out of what they want into. But then, will corporations have a greater control um, over our internet activity and greater access to our information? Um, those sorts of things. That's where things and nobody. And here's the this the more reading I do, nobody really knows the answers to these questions. No. They they really don't. So we're having these ideological arguments about something that's net neutrality, and and this ruling doesn't even rescind a lot of the things that still make the internet neutral. The other thing that they talk about this is really interesting. One of the things that net neutrality and the government control does is that um, the, the government has lots of uh, contact points with their internet stream, and they're constantly flipping spying on us, right? Um, and so in some ways, we have less privacy with a government-controlled internet, um, and it's really about how much do you trust the government? Do you trust the government to do good things with that information? If well, you is it the Russian government? Well, that's... What are you saying? Give, give it a couple of years. Really? I, I, I want to. I want to, Bart. I want to jump in real quick because there's a, there's a couple things that you that you talked about here, and one of them directly relates to to crisis intervention services through through crisis centers. And so, and when we're, when you're talking about transparency, if this if one of their goals is to increase transparency uh, from the corporations, just an, an issue that we don't exactly know what that means. But let's say that 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 is where they say you will have access to all of these different products or services or something like that um, and a person looks at that and you know what you know what that looks like when you get a cable brochure and you have all these logos for all of these different channels that you'll have access to in your in your tier that you're purchasing now imagine that with the internet all of those things and try to make sure that whatever you use for crisis online crisis support is one of those approved uh, so let's say that somebody doesn't know that any of this is going on. They aren't paying attention to net neutrality. Uh, net neutrality gets gutted, and then some th things may change in a couple years, but it takes a while, and it's probably slow, and it's probably uh, done in a way that, yes, we're increasing transparency on the, on the surface level, but a lot of things are just taking so long to implement that people don't notice. So now you say like, a, like six months, eight months down the the road and to try to access their favorite crisis intervention service, whether it's their local crisis center, or whether it's something like Seven Cups of Tea, um, one of the peer, online peer support services. 
And guess what? The largest online so, community support network. They are. And, and guess what? Now, and, and again, this is just hypothetical, but let's say now the domain that they had been hosting on was not, uh, that, had been, that had been hosting their services is now not part of the, the trusted uh, network uh, that the ISP has, has put forth. So now you don't have access to your, your favorite service. Uh, but they weren't paying attention, so they wouldn't have known. If now you have a scenario like that. One of the other things that um, that Bo has talked about too, in terms of of the uh, potential impact to crisis centers, and again, this is chat, um, chat related, is that if this does happen, and we're and we start worrying about um, what we can and can't potentially say, is that going to change the way that the end user is interacting with the crisis counselor? Well, so, I, mean, I don't know if this changed the way that they censorship is super duper suppositional. Like that's probably not a that's probably not a real that's probably not a real fundamental issue here. It has been for SPSM. Like they didn't like the way that we notated things and shut down that, our YouTube account. And yeah, and I'm sorry. Yeah, that's true, but that's not related to like, that. So, but, but they could do things like that. They would have no, more power well, to do things. No, like I think that. I think. Uh, no, no. Maybe differently too, like Bo. Bo, is there is there any circumstance where people might try to hide their identity, um, or even secondarily, accidentally hide their identity by trying to use services that allow them to get around some things that might be put in place if net neutrality is gutted? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I you know I talked. I think it was about a month ago or so about that, um, and just you know, and again, this is all suppositional. So who knows? But. If you start putting barriers in places where there were not barriers before, and pretty much, I mean, especially the youth, right? They're all just used to just getting on whatever and going wherever they want, you know, at the same speed, whatever. As soon as, as, soon as the barrier is put in place, someone will figure out a way to get around that barrier, and then that will spread like wildfire. You know, this isn't like the 80s where people could, like, figure out how to cut into their neighbor's cable or whatnot, because that was an involved process that you probably, like, pull Homer Simpson and nearly kill yourself. Or make long distance like calls that. with little whistles I mean, through the telephone. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, like, and again, this could be years down the road, but at some point, like, if the government is just like, okay, net neutrality is gone, and people start noticing, like, my God, my Netflix is really, really slow or whatnot, they will go, they will figure out a way around it. That, that way will completely hide their identity, and then that will have absolutely a repercussion on suicide prevention services online. Um, you know, and like, I mean, honestly, just, and again, I kind of talked about this, just, I don't want to know what this will be like for all of our clients who rely on online supports, whatever that looks like. Chris, you and I have been banging the bell about gaming communities, you know, being very supportive. Those are pretty much almost always online, right? So what happens if someone can't access their usual Twitch stream that they go to and talk to that community based around a specific streamer or based, based oh, around a God. specific community? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just and not we, just and not just access the community, but just as a coping skill. Like I have a lot right? of clients who have very limited economic means, but they have ways of streaming videos or movies, like as a as a distraction skill, right? Mm -hmm. And something like Twitch yeah. is going to be one of those like first to, to be targeted because of its its uh, high data usage, because it's streaming video yeah. and it's Twitch is number based. three, I think, in data on the internet. I mean, it's Netflix. It's Netflix and everyone else, right? Netflix is stupid, gigantic. It's stupid. It, like it's it it doesn't. It's honestly, I I. It's the one thing that makes me think. Well, there's got to be something to do about that because Netflix is really taking advantage of the system. I think I think about a year ago or so, I saw something that said that over half of the streaming uh, traffic online is through Netflix. So oh, yeah. over half. Mm -hmm. Well over but in the, in the case of Twitch, in the case of YouTube, in the case of Hangouts on Air, who pays for those? Advertisers. Yeah. Advertisers pay for all those. So what that means really to the consumer, nothing. Nothing at all. It will not affect the individual team's experience. The advertiser, however, is going to have to pay more per minute or per second for delivering advertising because they're going to end up paying the bill because they're the customer. They're the one that's paying for it. Bart, were you going to say something? Well, I, I think that just, just reading all the articles, I think there's an incredible amount 
of hysteria around this issue when people don't really understand that, in fact, the rules that we have in place may be, in fact, actually clamping down and making it more difficult um, to get access to things than if it was open. So this is this, this is who's paying for the internet. So to, to, is Netflix kicking in what they should be kicking in for the the traffic they're generating? Right. What if, in fact? We're all subsidized and flip. And what is Netflix? Eight dollars a month, eleven dollars a month, depending on which plan. Mm-hmm. What if, in fact, these big broadband providers are subsidized and flipping um, Netflix, not mm-hmm. getting the cash they should be getting out of Netflix, which in fact means that they they can't do the things they need to do to make the internet even better and faster. So, this but is- isn't that but isn't that kind of a dodge, Bart? Like, shouldn't that cost be ultimately passed on to the consumer? So. If so, like they should improve the services because the consumer demand is there. But historically, that's not been what they do. You know, that's not how they behave. Yeah. Yeah, we don't know that. Do you know that? I mean, do do you know what? Do you know? Totally. I know that. I mean, since the early '90s, which is when the the government really first started looking at the internet and saying, "Oh, we should probably do something about this here internet thing that's really exploded." And what they did was basically nothing. Like they, they got all the media, the internet service provider companies in a big room, and were let, and were just like, hey, you figure it out, you know? You, I mean, because they didn't actually think the internet was going to be a big thing, right? And so now, flash forward to where we're at, and if for those of you who ever watch Adam Runs Everything, it's a wonderful show. He did an entire show on this topic. The United States internet is horrible. It's horrible. It's one of the worst in the developed world. Yeah. And it's because these these companies are allowed to just have like local like giant local monopolies and they don't have any reason to compete with each other. Um, and if you got net neutrality, they're really not going to have any reasons to compete with each other. Instead, they can shuffle all their costs down to like like Tony said the advertisers the domain hosts, people like Netflix or whatnot, and say what you will about what Netflix is doing with the internet. You know, they, any company will take advantage of a system if if that system is presented to itself. I'm not going to paint Netflix as villains here because they're just doing what they need to do. Um, but, but it's, the, it's the, just the, but Bo, the folks arguing against net neutrality make the exact opposite case. They make the case that in fact, because they can't charge more. Um, why would they invest a whole bunch to make it better when, in fact, everything is being held and regulated by the federal government? But they so, can't charge more. What? They can charge more. They can't charge more, but they can't charge more to um, uh, to d- d- they can't charge more based on your um, who's accessing what. Right. Everybody gets the exact same treatment. And the, the new rule says that they're utilities, which means it limits what they can do in terms of pricing. So yep. here's the question. Since, since net neutrality is so friggin' amazing, mm-hmm. what's so much better from 2015 to now? What's better? Oh, because your, your personal cost did not your your personal cost did not skyrocket didn't sky, but and, and and you're saying that costs prior to 2015 were skyrocketing they went up quite a bit but your demand went up too so like that's what i tried to describe in my long blah blah, yeah, blah. so we don't but we don't have any so, evidence do we have can, any evidence can, that anything changed after Chris, 2015 can I, anybody well can what, I read what, a t- what we know is that europe i'm sorry april that europe and and in the and let's see, South Korea, and, you know, these are diff. There's different places, okay? So yeah. they're and geographically they're very different, and I'm so there's you. obvious arguments <laughs> here. But they don't, they do not treat this this way. So this is treated a different way in Europe, and they consider the internet to be a common regulated resource, and they do just dandy, and their internet connections are a lot better than ours. So much better. Is this like well, universal a, healthcare? It's usually yeah. a space thing. It kind of is. It kind of is. Yeah. But, yeah, but it's, it's usually, but, okay. it, but yeah. it's like universal healthcare. It's a population based thing and it's a space thing. Um, yeah. The infrastructure is a lot tighter. Yeah. Um, so I need April, to read a tweet, tweet from Stacy Friedenthal. She says opposing Stacey net Friedenthal. neutrality is sort of like hating old ladies and children and puppies. In other words, only money grubbing <laughs> corporate titans could oppose it. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> yep. I was yeah. gonna read it. Can I retweet? Can I retweet that? Was that good? Yeah, that's gonna, good. yeah, that's good. Okay, Bart doesn't like it. I, well, again, it, it's certainly 
as, as we've learned recently, facts don't matter as much as what your political narrative is. And yeah. as long as your political narrative supports your point of view, then then let's not let the facts get in the way of a good narrative. I well, that's right. Okay, but so why would we do, like, why would we do that? Tell, that's you guys crazy. Are like, should the government should the government regulate this or money grubbing corporations? And I'm like, both of these things don't sound so great. Well, yeah, uh, and then you have. Oh. Yeah, I, I think Bart's right. When you have uh, when you have a, a, a governmental body that is uh, being run by people who don't um, align with your political views, you're going to say that that's not the right option. If you don't politically align with the rights of corporations, you're not going to you're not going to see that as the, the good option. So, where does it come? I mean, like, where does it come down to? Uh, who who gets the money? Where's the money going? How, who owns the internet? This is an Tell us what to do. The internet itself is an experiment, and it has evolved quite a bit in the last 10 years, and the next 10 years should look even weirder than the last 10 years looked. So nobody really knows what the implications are here. What we do know is that the United States strategy for having a high speed internet, a high speed internet, and a high and high broad, a high bandwidth broadband internet, is very poor. Our strategy is very poor in comparison to the to to our or to our trading partners. So, is this a solution to that? I don't think so. No, I think this is just jockeying about who's going to split up the revenue that's, that exists. This is not answering the actual question is where is this country's gigabit and uni virtually universal gigabit internet connection, like the internet connection that Germany and Japan and South Korea and, and, and can all depend yeah. upon every day. And they didn't even think twice about it. They don't, but you're talking about areas that are con incredibly concentrated that aren't covering the landmass that we're covering. Exactly. So you're you're absolutely tr you're absolutely correct. However, that that argument falls apart in places like New York City, Chicago, St. Louis, hey, Los Angeles. I'll find out. Those are high population density areas, and their internet is just as bad or worse than yours in in the in suburban St. Louis. Yeah, I mean we built. We build a highway system, right? I mean, the U.S. government has more money than God. If they wanted to revamp the United States internet structure, it could. It doesn't because it's trying to throw it all on co companies. We're still so, what I, so what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing both say is that we need a massive economic depression <laughs> to then create a uh, jobs jobs based system. Well, and then a war. And, 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 yeah, yeah, well, that's uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're, you're, but, you don't want to go back and look at the economic data on whether the the new <laughs> deal actually helped or not. Do you? Oh, that's yeah, not well, the new that's deal. The, the highway is not the new deal. You see what we've done, everybody? We got five minutes out, and we're we <laughs> you're, wow, throwing the new, you're throwing the new yeah, deal in. Are you, are you are you are you Keynesian? Have you gone full? You've gone full Keynesian oh. right here. <laughs> Right here, you've gone full Keynesian. I'm more of a Hayek guy myself. It's what, what, what would Hayek say? Uh, what would he say? Yeah, what would he say? Let fucking let's oh, say let it be. No, how about, how about let's do this? Let's go. Let's go to final thoughts. It's fine. Let's go to final thoughts, Bart. My my final thought is that this may this is likely to pass. Would be my guess. I don't think any of us are going to notice a goddamn thing when it passes. I don't think any of the, I don't think we're going to end up like the Portugal system. I don't think we'll even notice a damn thing. I think in a couple of years we'll have a good idea of what, whether this helped or not, and then we can figure out what we need to do next. It's not like the it's not like a switch is going to be flipped and all of a sudden you're going to go on the internet and get hit with thirty tears and you got to start funneling your money out. This is not like Battlefront, my friends. These are not micro transactions. Um, you will still have access to your internet on the, on on uh, whatever the date is they vote on this, whether whether it votes yes or no, and you won't. The schlubs like us aren't going to notice a goddamn difference, regardless of what the vote is. Period. That's my two cents. Tony, agree, but the longer the 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 longer trajectory is an unknown, untested, uncontrolled experiment. So if you're for corporate uncontrolled experiments, which I am, um, but if but if you're for it, then you're for deregulation. Let it let it be. But if you're against it, I'd stick with net neutrality, which 
we support the, the Beatles are pro net a uh, pro uh, getting rid of net neutrality. What would the Beatles say about this, Tony? Well, well how, old, be, how old? How old the, the are the ones Beatles? that are still alive are John Lennon through so a uh, through old. a zombie uh, or uh, perhaps zombie we, Yoko. Zombie. I go I, when I when I talk about internet zombie. issues and net neutrality. So my alive. first can you let Chris my be? first go to person are the are the elderly. Uh, Bo. Right. The very incredibly wealthy elderly people. Let's cut to them, everybody. Oh, right. final thoughts. Final, final thoughts. thoughts. Okay, number one. Nothing that's been left in the hands of United States corporations has gone well. So just let that happen. And I don't understand why more in the future. What what the hell have I got in my hand? I've got the most amazing device in my hand that ever existed. <laughs> Because of corporate, and, you know, and and lots of the government didn't make this phone. The iPhone's stupid. It's overpriced. It's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, but this is. I'd like to think net neutrality is just a wonderful example of one of those tech things that we all think we don't understand or whatnot. But no matter what happens with it, it will have. And I'll speak from the center side of thing. It will have an impact. Who knows what the time frame is? But it will have an impact on your center and how things are done, or your agency, or the entire suicide prevention you know, industry. And what, what we need to realize is that these kinds of things are going to be happening more and more often, and we can't just start rolling with whatever tech punches you know, happens. You know, we have to find one side or the other to take and then try to advocate for ourselves. Yeah, like don't, don't get complacent, complete. don't get tired, don't get worn out, don't get exhausted because it's a lot of shit. I totally agree. April, how, how have we done? Did we final thoughts wise? Final did we thoughts, do okay? I understand this better than when I showed up. As did several other people. Comments like, uh, "So longest we've heard from Tony in one stretch in a really long time. Great job, wonderful explanations." So my final thoughts is because this matters so much for people getting care in emergencies because we're going to increasingly use technology and we're going that involves internet access to be able to provide all kinds of services for people at risk of suicide that probably even if it's really hard people like me who are not, this is not my area probably need to pe listen to people like Bo and Chris and Tony and Bart so that we can be really aware when we vote and also when we prepare and when we prepare ahead to take care of others yeah, uh, and then my, my final thought, and, and I actually mostly agree with Bart on this, in that we need to we need to be informed. We need to we need to read and do some research about what net neutrality is and where where we might align ourselves. Um, and when you're done doing that, then you go to battleforthenet.com and you put in your phone number and you can contact your representatives and support net neutrality. Um, so that's that's my final thought. Woo! Woo! You guys, I, you just you brought it in right on the line. Everybody, Lost Survivor Day was yesterday. It's coming up next year. Chris, where are the resources if people are interested in what the Lost Survivor resources near them? How do you how do people find that again? Uh, I would check out afsp.org or just uh, Google International Lost Survivor Day. Uh, please do access resources, and when you find something that really works, and you can responsibly share a picture. Uh, post something on SPSM's Facebook page, uh, tweet out something with hashtag SPSS, SPSM, make sure to help other people find the resources that you know about. If there are resources that, that don't exist that you want, let us know. Let's put that out in the universe so that people can follow up on that and follow up on the net neutrality stuff. Get educated. It's been another SPSM. Next week is our favorite SPSM game hour and open mic night. We'll be chatting about suicide prevention while we're goofing off. Uh, there'll be more details about that on our Facebook page and on our blog as we solidify those going into next Sunday night. But we're going to be hanging out. That's what the leftover turkey time is for, folks. Grab yourself some pie. Grab your phone. Come chill with us. And then Stacey Friedenfall is going to be on week after next. I know I love the for that. Bye. Peace. Bye, everybody. Peace.